So welcome everybody to the second webinar of the Manitoba Important Bird Areas Program Spring Webinar Series. My name is Amanda and I am the coordinator of the Manitoba IBA program at Nature Manitoba. And before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are joining this webinar from across the province of Manitoba in the territories of the Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Oji Cree nations and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The Nature Manitoba office sits in Treaty 1 territory, the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe people and homeland of the Métis Nation. All of these people have been caretakers of the land since time immemorial and continue to be strong caretakers today and into the future. We are here today to learn about the decline and restoration of Delta Marsh with Dr. Gordon Goldsboro. Dr. Goldsboro is a professor at the University of Manitoba who specializes in water quality and the impacts of human activities on lakes and wetlands. He has guided conservation policy for wetlands across the country, including Lake Winnipeg. He has worked closely at Delta Marsh for many years, including writing his doctoral dissertation on the effects of agricultural herbicides on the productivity and community structure of benthic algae in Delta Marsh. He has served as the director of the unfortunately uh, closed now Delta Marsh Field Station from 1996 to 2010, and has been working together with Ducks Unlimited, Unlimited Canada on the Restoring the Tradition projects at Delta Marsh. Besides his scientific interests, Dr. Goldsboro is involved with the Manitoba Heritage Community uh, as president of the Manitoba Historical Society, an editor of the Prairie History Magazine, and author of the Abandoned Manitoba series. He has received the Order of Manitoba in 2021 for his contributions to the province. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Goldsboro, you can go ahead and share your screen and we'll get started. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, there are some silver linings to clouds like a pandemic. And I think one of them is that uh, we are much more comfortable doing presentations like this one. And of course, the upside on a day like today is that even in the middle of a blizzard, we can carry on and do a presentation. So I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. I have to say it kind of brought me to a sort of a conclusion of a work that has been in, in, the, in the process for many years. Uh, the work we've been doing at Delta Marsh began oh, back in the 1990s. And uh, it just occurred to me today that it's been now over 20 years since we began working on the things that I'm going to describe to you this evening. Of course, it's typical to talk about the rise and fall of something, you know, the Roman Empire, for example. Well, in this case, it's the reverse. Uh, what I'm going to describe first is what happened to Delta Marsh, and then subsequently how I think we are on the verge of seeing a dramatic improvement in the health of this uh, once proud uh, prairie wetland. Before I do that, though, I wanted to give you just a bit of an introduction to the topic of coastal wetlands, of which Delta Marsh is one. Uh, a number of years ago, one of my graduate students did an inventory of the coastal wetlands around our three large lakes. Now, I know people often think when they hear the word coastal that we're referring to something associated with an ocean. But the reality is it simply refers to a, a body of something next to a large body of water. And of course, we do have some pretty large lakes in Manitoba, what I like to call the Manitoba Great Lakes. A associated with the borders of those large lakes then are coastal wetlands. And perhaps to give you an example, uh, so you can think no further than Grand Beach. The, of course, the Great Sandy Beach uh, has behind it a large lagoon which is, in fact, one example of a coastal wetland on Lake Winnipeg. Now, they vary in numbers and they are vary in position, but there are two very large coastal wetlands uh, in Manitoba. Uh, one is at the south end of the Lake Winnipeg system. That's the Netley Lebo Marsh. It's widely believed to be the largest freshwater coastal wetland in all of North America. At the south end of Lake Manitoba is the Delta Marsh, and that's what I'm going to be speaking about this evening. It is believed to be the second largest coastal wetland in North America. Now, I, I often have to uh, explain, I think, the potential benefits that humans acquire from wetlands because there is still, I think, it's ch the attitude is changing, but there is still an attitude that wetlands aren't all that useful. They, aren't, they have no economic value. Well, the reality is they do. 
Uh, and it goes back an awfully long way. This photo, for instance, an archival photo of a farmer somewhere in the Gimli area that went out into some of these coastal wetlands, harvesting the vegetation and bringing it back to feed his livestock. It was what they called wild hay. And of course, the reality is that is a definite benefit, an economic benefit to the farmer and to his, to his livestock. And that's simply one of the economic values of these coastal wetlands. They, we know now that they are important habitat for lake fish, that the populations of fish that we look for in our sport fishery, in our commercial fishery, uh, are a direct result of the spawning and the feeding that occurs in these coastal wetlands. Likewise, migratory birds, things like ducks and geese, uh, often stage in these coastal wetlands. They, you know, they spend time on their way uh, south in the fall, north in the spring. Uh, there's also evidence that they breed in some of these marshes as well. We know uh, based on studies of, of shorelines that anything that you can do to consolidate the sediment of the shore helps in reducing erosion. And so when you leave natural vegetation, for example, shorelines are more stable than they would be in the absence of the vegetation. And then ultimately, as we confront the problems facing lakes like Lake Winnipeg, that is going through dramatic changes in water quality, the reality is that the natural ability of the vegetation and the other living things in wetlands help to remove a lot of the contaminants that would otherwise go into the lake. So I often describe coastal wetlands as nature's kidneys. They, they essentially help to purify water on its way into the lake. Now, I confess that much of the story that I'm going to be telling this evening does not pertain directly to birds. Uh, the reality is, and I'm sure Amanda can attest to this, I am not a specialist in any way, shape, or form on birds. Uh, I, I, I know a, a bird when I see one. I don't know if I could tell you necessarily what it is, but I realize that they are an important constituent of these coastal wetlands. And so ultimately, the conclusion of my story, I hope to sort of leave you with an impression that conditions are better now than Delta Marsh and other coastal marshes as a result of restoration work on other things in the ecosystem. So let's, let's focus on Delta Marsh now. Uh, again, to orient you, uh, Winnipeg is shown here. It is about an hour and a half northwest of Winnipeg on the south end of Lake Manitoba. And it's believed to have been formed about 2,500 years ago uh, as a result of what's referred to as barrier beach formation uh, at the south end of the lake. In other words, that Delta Marsh was at one time part of Lake Manitoba. Uh, the, the Assiniboine River also flowed out into Lake Manitoba at that time. It, it didn't go into Winnipeg and meet the Red River at the Forks the way it does today. And in fact, there was at one time a substantial river delta flowing out into Lake Manitoba. Uh, the, this is not, however, the basis for the name of Delta Marsh. Uh, it's a mere kind of coincidence that it was, in fact, once a river delta. The name uh, derives from the fact that at one time in the early 20th century, there was a railway that went from Portes La Prairie to northward to meet Lake Manitoba. And the stations on that railway were named for the letters of the Greek alphabet, station Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and the fourth one, the station Delta. That's where the name came from. Well, as I will tell you a little bit later, there are a number of issues confronting Delta Marsh, and the one that I'm planning to focus on this evening is but one of them. But I first want to convince you that this is a worthwhile uh, inv investment of our, our time and effort, that the Delta Marsh is an important place. Back in 1982, the federal government in Canada designated wetlands of international significance under something called the Ramsar Convention. Uh, basically, this is an international agreement between nations that recognize wetlands for some sort of significant contribution. And there's various criteria as to what the wetland can provide. Uh, in the case of Delta Marsh, it was selected on the basis of its importance as bird habitat. And I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. 1982, it became Manitoba's, uh, one of Manitoba's two Ramsar wetlands. The other one, being the uh, uh, Okamic Marsh. The, uh, the, the, in 1988, the, uh, the uh, Delta Marsh was designated as a heritage marsh 
by the provincial government. And in 1999, Bird Studies Canada, in partnership with regional organizations like Nature Manitoba here in Manitoba, designated the Delta Marsh as an IBA, an important bird area. All of these designations were in recognition of Delta's importance as bird habitat. Now, there's, a, there's an easy way to demonstrate this importance by showing you some archival photos. So these pair, for instance, might horrify you uh, because, of course, they show rather substantial numbers of ducks and geese that have been killed through hunting. The reality was that at one time, Delta Marsh was perceived to have a limitless quantity of these waterfowl. And I think the feeling was at the time that there simply was no possibility of exhausting that resource. Uh, the photo in the bottom, for instance, had written on the back of it, three days bag, implying that the birds that we see hanging on the side of that building were all acquired in the course of three days. And this, as a result, Delta Marsh was legendary, literally around the world, for the abundance of waterfowl that it supported. And as a result, people came from far and wide to, uh, to, to, to duck hunt. Uh, and one of the famous people, for instance, who came was Clark Gable. Of course, at the time, at the height of his fame as a Hollywood star, uh, he came and shot ducks and enjoyed mightily his opportunity to commune with nature at Delta Marsh. So again, the perception was that it was a, a vast resource that there was no possibility of humans ever exhausting. Well, of course, humans did contribute to the destruction of Delta Marsh, uh, along with other factors. And the majority of the consequences that I'm going to describe can be dated to around the 1950s, 1960s. So if we enumerate them, and I, and I don't have the time this evening to go into the detail to justify each of these points, uh, I will speak to some of them directly and some of them uh, not. Uh, we do, of course, know that Delta Marsh is surrounded by active agricultural land where things like fertilizer are being used with increasing frequency. Uh, there, are, there is li livestock operations from which manure emanates. We have domestic sewage because of the fact that there's a large number of residential cottages along the lakeshore between Delta Marsh and Lake Manitoba. In fact, one of the earliest cottage developments in Manitoba. All of these are sources of pollution, things like nitrogen and phosphorus, which contribute to the excessive growth of algae and other plants to the detriment of the ecosystem. We've also documented a number of invasive species that have inhabited the marsh. And one of them that dates back, we think, to at least the 1930s is uh, the hybrid cattail, a, a hybrid produced between the native North American cattail and an introduced European cattail. It's very vigorous, as many hybrids are. It thrives in across a range of water levels. It especially likes water that contains lots of nutrients. And as a result, it did very nicely at Delta Marsh. In fact, to the extent that I believe that virtually all the cattails we have at Delta Marsh are probably now the hybrid. There are a number of other consequences of, of change that uh, I think are all connected in some way. For one, we have seen a marked increase in the turbidity of the water, the murkiness, essentially. We have seen a, decli a decline in the number of submersed plants. And we've seen fewer numbers of wildlife. So in fact, the, the abundance of waterfowl that brought people to Delta Marsh for literally for millennia, the, du the duck hunters were only, the, uh, the, the European duck hunters, I should say, uh, have only been here since perhaps the turn of the 20th century. But we know that indigenous people were hunting waterfowl in this area going back thousands of years because we find, among other things, uh, indigenous points along the shoreline of Lake Manitoba. One of the signs of this decline, in fact, can be seen from the abundance of the muskrat population in Delta Marsh. At one time, there was indeed a active uh, trapping uh, uh, in the uh, marsh. Uh, muskrats were trapped for their fur, and uh, that po the populations that were collected annually ranged in the thousands. As you can see in this graph in the, from the 1940s, the 1950s, up until the late 1950s, population estimates of anywhere from 20,000 to as perhaps as many as 100,000 muskrats, there was a, a, a catastrophic decline that occurred through the 1960s 
And in fact, this persists to this day. I, I personally can't recall the last time I saw any significant number of muskrats in Delta Marsh. I sometimes refer to them as marsh canaries because just as a canary can in indicate declining air quality in a mine, I think the absence of muskrats in a marsh indicate the absence of good habitat conditions for them. And, and there's, a, see, there's, there's a number of possible reasons for this. I think one of the major ones is the common carp. Uh, carp are an in introduced fish species, uh, but unlike a lot of the other invasive species that we have in North America, this one was introduced intentionally. Uh, it was brought here, we believe, at least here, I mean to Manitoba, uh, in the early uh, 1880s as a potential food fish. Uh, the quote from a government report at the time said that uh, it was potential food for the poor man's table, as, assuming therefore that if, uh, if, if a poor person could not afford to buy you know, beef or pork or chicken or some of the other you know, mainstream meats, well, you could eat carp. Uh, unfortunately, carp are not an especially tasty fish because of the nature of their diet. Uh, I often say the best way to describe them is to take the word carp and transpose the A and the R. Uh, they are an incredibly prolific fish. Uh, the average adult female carp can produce up to 2 million eggs annually. They lack many natural predators, and therefore there are relatively few checks on their numbers. As a result, they have thrived. Uh, they are a problem in the sense that they are a what we refer to as a benthivore, meaning they feed on the small uh, insect life and other things living in marsh sediment. And in the process of separating the food from the uh, sediment, they greatly increase turbidity. They, they basically suspend the sediment into the water. Uh, they also, in the course of spawning, uh, can disrupt the vegetation. And that in turn causes the uh, wind to, in, in, to raise the sediment from the bottom as well. So there's a whole series of, uh, of effects that, that carp have to dramatically increase turbidity of water, which in turn has corresponding cascading effects on other components of the ecosystem. Uh, one of my former graduate students, uh, Pascal Badiou, who now is a scientist at Ducks Unlimited Canada, went through records of fish observation and catch throughout Manitoba going back to the early 20th century. And this, these uh, four maps that he compiled show where carp have been recorded. Uh, so before the 1940s, essentially the only place where carp were observed was in the Red River. Uh, subsequently, they managed to get into the Assiniboine River. Of course, no surprise, the two are connected. And they made their way essentially into the Manitoba Great Lakes from there. So that by the time you get into the 1960s, early 1970s, they are essentially throughout the Manitoba Great Lakes. They're making their way down the Nelson River. So that by 2000, uh, they essentially have reached every body of water that is connected. In other words, everywhere they can swim. Uh, they've been found at Churchill. Uh, they've been found at uh, the mouth of the Nelson River. They are a abundant and uh, a destructive fish. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Dale Robleski at Ducks Unlimited Canada, now retired, uh, did an awful lot of work on the fish that were in the Delta Marsh in the 1990s uh, to understand some of the pressures that were affecting the marsh. And he found, and this is some of his data from the year 1999, he found that in some years, uh, a, a half of the fish that he caught in nets, you can see him in the back here, showing the nets they were using, half of them were carp. Uh, in fact, I would submit that this is perhaps an underestimate because as the old fish tale goes, uh, the big ones get away. That in effect, the large muscular uh, fish simply aren't caught by these nets. They punch their way through and only the smaller carp are caught. So I would submit that the number probably was higher than the half that, it, the, that his data show. Well, the, the solution to carp is to keep them out of the habitat from which they're causing destruction. This turns out to be a fairly standard approach. A few years ago, I had an opportunity to visit a place called Coots Paradise. 
at the west end of Lake Ontario near the city of Hamilton. There we see a large structure that was erected that is between the Coots Paradise, which is fairly well named, I'm told. It's a, a bird haven. Uh, it is also a very nice coastal wetland, has lots of vegetation in it. And this structure is designed to exclude carp almost entirely. Now, the, because of the way this has been designed, there's a series of large cages that are behind the screens and carp that are trying to get into the Coots Paradise get caught in these screens. And then subsequently, and this just boggled my mind when I first saw it, was they actually employ people to hand sort the fish that they catch in these large cages. In the back of this photo, uh, that sort of brownish cage you can see is one of the cages they catch the fish in. They discharge the fish into a, into a tank. Then they go manually, and this the person in the orange uh, suit here is operating a little flap gate. And as the fish come down the gate, the, uh, the uh, trough, they are sorted by hand. Good fish go into the Hoots Coots Paradise, bad fish do not. Uh, this is the sort of approach that can happen when you have a small coastal wetland. I said again, Delta Marsh is the second largest on the continent, 18,500 hectares compared to Coots Paradise, which is somewhere in the range of about 60, I think. So the logistics of this sort of approach to a carp exclusion simply do not work on a larger scale. And so I'll show you another approach that we adopted. Before we did this though, before we got into doing carp exclusion, we wanted to demonstrate, we wanted to prove that carp were in fact responsible for the changes that we see, we're seeing in the Delta Marsh. So one of the experiments we conducted very early on, this goes back now to 2000, 22 years ago, we investigated the effects of carp in a series of diked areas in Delta Marsh. It's, it was an area that had been constructed uh, in the 1980s for use in a long-term experiment on the effects of water level change in Delta Marsh. By the time we came along in 2000, they were no longer in use. So we thought, hey, this is pretty good. We've got some areas that are enclosed. In other words, that we can put fish into these areas that are enclosed and they can't get out. And we can therefore monitor what happens when carp get into the system. So uh, one of my graduate students, Pascal Badiou, uh, stocked these cells at varying densities of carp. So the numbers you're seeing that superimposed over this aerial photo show the densities of carp. And the numbers, to be honest, were determined on the basis of the range of density that we anticipated might occur in Delta Marsh. Because at that time, we really didn't know what sort of density carp were in Delta Marsh because there was really no easy way to measure it. So we thought, well, we'll just span the entire possible range from no carp on the left hand, uh, hand side of this uh, picture, all the way through to 1200 kilograms of carp per hectare, which is probably higher than, than occurs in the marsh. It's probably higher than occurs in pretty much any marsh, but we wanted just to see the range of possibilities and what it would do. Uh, they, as you can see, there were several others in between. The idea then was that we monitored the conditions of these enclosed areas over a period of time to see how the conditions changed. And there's a whole series of measurements that uh, Pascal did in the course of his work. One of the things that he measured was the suspended sediment that was being kicked up from the bottom by the burrowing activities of the carp. One of the graphs that he acquired in the course of doing his measurements was this one. It shows us on the horizontal axis, the biomass of carp that had been stocked in those enclosures. On the vertical axis, it shows the dry weight of the, of the material that was suspended and then subsequently collected in some traps that he had installed. And as you can see, I think the relationship is a perfect linear one. In other words, the more carp there are, the more suspended sediment there is, and of course, vice versa. The fewer the carp, the lower the suspended sediment. So it made a fairly convincing case that carp exclusion could reduce turbidity. There were other th things though too. He found, for instance, that for every 100 kilograms per hectare of carp that he added to those enclosed areas, there was a corresponding linear increase in the nutrients in the water, the nitrogen, 
the phosphorus, and that in turn contributed to algae and other plant growth. There was a corresponding increase in suspended particles, as I've just shown you. There was an increase in the algae, the phytoplankton, as it's sometimes called. There was a corresponding decrease, however, in the submersed plants, simply because the water clarity diminished dramatically. And of course, submersed plants require light for photosynthesis. In the absence of light, they diminish. So that was one of our first clues that carp exclusion in Delta Marsh could work. So our next step then was to do a slightly larger scale experiment. In 2001, uh, the year after we began the work in those cells, those enclosed cells, we began a larger scale manipulative experiment uh, with the help from Manitoba Hydro. They helped fund this project. And uh, over the course of four years, we did a couple of manipulations to areas in the marsh. In some areas of the marsh, we excluded carp. In other words, we kept them out of places they had previously been. We did this in two ways. One way was through the use of screens. And in fact, the first slide, the one at the very beginning of my presentation, I showed you one of the screens that we used in the course of this kind, this kind of work. And that was, the intention then was to allow water to pass through, but not carp. The alternative was to use these sandbag dikes. And the idea then was to exclude both water contact and carp to see if in that extreme case, could we see an improvement in conditions? And then subsequently in two, three successive years, we followed how the marshes changed. And did they change? Here's an aerial photo of, that, of the previous uh, view, view. That previous photo was taken showing the sandbag dike. On the left-hand side is the area of the marsh that you can see carp in. And the way you can tell that is the water is distinctly green mainly because of all the algae and other suspended material kicked up by the carp and the nutrients that the carp uh, resuspension cause uh, in growth of algae. On the right-hand side, you'll notice that the isolated area, isolated by the sandbag dike, is black. Well, the reason it's so dark is that the water became immediately clear. It was really quite remarkable uh, how quickly it, that happened. And as a result, you can see the uh, sediment at the bottom of this water body and it's a dark color. So a very visual demonstration of the effectiveness of carp exclusion. Now, at the same time as we were excluding carp from places they had previously been, we also in allowed carp to get into places they had previously not been. So with the use, with the careful use, I should add, of ditching dynamite, we created channels between some parts of Delta Marsh and others, allowing carp to get into areas of Delta Marsh they had previously not been. And again, the changes we saw were immediate and dramatic. So this pair of photos I'm showing you, on the left-hand side is a nice little pond that was isolated. There was no possibility of carp getting into it. There was no way for them to swim. And as a result, you can see in the photo, there's a number of beds of submerged plants growing to the surface. They are growing profusely. We then dynamited a channel into this little pond and connected it, enabling carp to get in. And as you can see, the very next year, the vegetation was gone. In fact, this was a fairly general response. Anytime we allowed carp in, the fish were more abundant. There were more carp. Uh, the water, however, was more turbid. There were more, there were more algae, more phytoplankton. There were less submerged plants. And there were other changes as well. For instance, we saw a 96% reduction in the, in, in the number of leopard frogs that inhabited these uh, isolated ponds. In fact, one of our students went further. Uh, she wanted to demonstrate how the, the uh, spawning activity of carp could jeopardize uh, frog populations in the long term. So one of the experiments that she carried out was to create what she called simulated frog egg masses. Uh, frogs typically attach their eggs to submerged vegetation from which they hatch and you course get tadpoles and then subsequently frogs. She used some styrofoam balls as, uh, as an artificial frog egg mass, and they were attached underwater to the stems of, in this case, cattail. Uh, you can't see them terribly easily, so I've circled them in the picture. On the right-hand side is an area to which carp had access. And as you can see, the foam balls are floating on the surface. 
to indicate that in fact they have been dislodged from the vegetation through the activity of the carp swimming in around the vegetation. So the assumption we make is that the effects of carp are not isolated to plants alone. They have profound effects on whole hosts of the wetland biota. In terms of submerged plants, I say that was my own personal interest. I am a botanist by training. I was interested in what the vegetation was going to do in response to the, uh, the exclusion or the inclusion of carp. And uh, so what we found again was fairly dramatic. And these bars you see on the left-hand side are pond, ponds that have carp naturally. In other words, they have had carp since the 1950s. And as you can see, the density of submerged vegetation is correspondingly low. The ponds that we blasted into, the ones that we introduced carp, likewise had low density. But in any other way, if we were to keep carp out either through natural isolation or from the installation of one of those sandbag dikes, or even from the installation of, of bars, in all cases, the density of vegetation was increased dramatically. So the net result was it was a fairly graphic demonstration that carp exclusion could have benefits uh, in terms of vegetation and potentially the other biota as well. So on this basis, we initiated what we called the Restoring the Tradition Project. Uh, the idea being is that there was a long tradition of waterfowling at Delta Marsh and Ducks Unlimited, which of course is, uh, is very concerned about waterfowl populations, they felt that it was important to demonstrate leadership to try to restore this once proud waterfowl marsh at, by way of a large scale carp exclusion. In other words, our intention, our plan was to exclude the carp from the entire marsh. Uh, and this wasn't a trivial undertaking. There were in fact seven places that we felt we had to install some sort of control structure. Uh, they're shown here on this, on this aerial photo of the marsh. Wherever there's a yellow dot, we built a structure. Uh, to give you an idea of the scale of these things, uh, here's one of the structures under construction during the winter of 2020, uh, or to, pardon me, 2012, 2013. Uh, they were large structures and correspondingly logistically complex. In the course of building them, we spent somewhere in the order of a few million dollars. So it was not a trivial undertaking at all. But when they were finished, they gave us the ability to exclude carp from the entire Delta Mars. This is one of the control structures after it was completed. And you might say, well, how is it excluding fish when the structure appears to be above water? Well, this is only the walkway across the top of the structure. Underneath this walkway are a series of screens that look like this. They essentially, they consist of metal bars that are seven centimeters apart. There is significance to this seven centimeter value, which I'll try to explain. In the course of preparing for this project, we installed hoop nets, nets that are basically shaped like long cylinders made out of a mesh, and they were installed on channels connecting Lake Manitoba to Delta Marsh. The, the idea being is that they would catch fish that were migrating from the lake into the marsh. In the course of that, we collected vast numbers of all sorts of fish, not just carp, but all sorts of other species that, that do come into the marsh. And one of the things we measured, among other things, were the widths of those fish. Now, this is not a parameter that fisheries biologists typically measure. It's common to measure things like the weight or sometimes the, something called the fork length, which is the distance from the snout to the tail. Uh, but rarely, if ever, do they measure the width. Uh, but we needed to know how wide the fish were so that we could give some insight to how wide, how far apart our bars should be. So these are some data from my colleague, Dr. Dale Robleski, showing the population of fish that were going through the Delta Channel uh, in 2010. The different symbols and colors denote different species of fish. And I'll draw your attention specifically to the pink squares. Those are the common carp. Those are the ones that we would choose to exclude. And I think as you can see that although there are some small carp shown at the left-hand side, the majority of the carp that were caught were of the larger end of the size scale. So when we looked at this and decided, well, how could we best exclude carp while not excluding other perhaps more desirable species? Well, the idea was to use a 70 
centimeter, pardon me, 70 millimeter bar spacing. Uh, and yes, it does potentially exclude other species, as you can see. However, there's another element to this experiment, which is the uh, timing of the deployment of these screens. They are not put in place and left there permanently. They are, in fact, removed later in the summer and then redeployed the following spring after a certain period of time has elapsed. The idea being is that carp are one of the last species to migrate from Lake Manitoba into Delta Marsh. By careful timing, it is possible to allow the majority of the desirable fish to get into Delta Marsh while excluding the majority of the undesirable fish. It is a quite remarkable undertaking to get this kind of information. It took phenomenal numbers of measurements, but uh, we're proud to say that we have achieved the objective of reducing the effect of carp while having a relatively minimal effect on the other species of fish that were present. To give you some idea of the effectiveness, here is a photograph taken uh, on a day when the carp were trying their best to get into Delta Marsh. You can see the water on the right-hand side of our structure on the left. The water is literally roiling with carp. So there's certainly an abundance. Uh, one of our colleagues, one of our uh, 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 participants in the project deployed a trail camera above the structure pointing straight down. And this was one of the photos that he took. You can see the abundance of carp that at times tried desperately to get into Delta Marsh and did not succeed. Now, admittedly, the smaller carp can pass through the bars. And that was not the ones we were intending to exclude. In fact, what we find is that the most destructive carp are the largest ones. The smaller ones, their impacts are relatively minor. So the idea then is say we were keeping out the most destructive species. Uh, interestingly, those trail cameras that we had at these structures also revealed something else that from the standpoint of bird life might prove interesting. We found substantial numbers of white pelicans gathering at these control structures because of course they are piscivorous. They are birds that eat fish and they really enjoyed the, uh, the plentiful resource that they found here. So much so that we actually found some fish uh, lodged in the throats of white pelicans. They had tried to engulf fish that were literally too big and they choked on them, which just goes to show that when people say that humans are the only gluttonous species, they are wrong. Uh, now, people often say, well, if there's this abundance of these noxious fish, is there not something that could be done productively with them? Yes, indeed. The provincial government did issue uh, licenses to fishers to catch carp at these structures. And here's one of the uh, activities that was being done over on the east side of Delta Marsh. They did manage to take a significant number of fairly large carp uh, out of the marsh on this occasion. And to be honest, uh, if I had to say what I think is the best approach for getting rid of carp, uh, it is not to include control structures like the ones we built. Uh, because they require an investment of time and resources, uh, I think a better approach is simply to exploit the resource. In other words, to catch the fish uh, so as to reduce the number of spawning adults and to allow, therefore, uh, that to control abundance rather than to have build uh, control structures like the ones we built. Uh, after the control structures were installed and the, net, the screens were deployed, there was a whole series of measurements that were taken including we measured the uh, migration of, of fish through the, the structures in the springtime. We did electro fishing in the marsh to, to look at what fish were in the marsh that had passed through the screens. We took uh, plasma samples from birds that are collected at the marsh to look at their, their condition, their, their ability to uh, be sufficiently nourished to make the, uh, the, the flight in the fall. Uh, we did surveys of waterfowl use. I'll show you some results of that right at the end. We, we mapped the submerged vegetation to look at whether it was responding favorably. And then my contribution to the experiment was to monitor water quality, specifically things like nutrients, the clarity of the water, the amount of algae, and so on. Uh, from 2009, actually before we put in these structures, until 2017, on a two to three week basis, we went to every position shown on the map here at a yellow pin which believe me is a logistic challenge because it's a very large marsh. It takes a long time to get from one side of it to the other. 
Uh, but we went around the entire marsh collecting water samples. We measured all sorts of things. And in fact, one of the times, well, not just one, actually quite a few of the times when we did this, we had the benefit of an airboat provided by the provincial government. Uh, this allowed us to get around the marsh much faster. And uh, we were there, therefore able to see differences that occurred uh, almost simultaneously, depending on where you were in the marsh. The sort of parameters we measured, uh, if you're familiar at all with water quality testing, we measured the clarity of the water with something called a Secchi disk. We measured the turbidity directly using a device called a turbidimeter. We measured the penetration of light into the water. We measured how many suspended solids there were, the, essentially the, the sediment that was being churned up from the wind and the carp. And we measured things like the chlorophyll by the algae. And then occasionally we measured things like the nutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphorus. Ultimately, when we looked at all these data, it was a very large, rather messy data set. And what we found was that the post carp improvement in water quality that we, we, we had knew we would see based on our, our small scale experiments was somewhat muted by the fact that there was so much spatial and temporal variability in the measurements. That's essentially one of the reasons we switched to using the airboat for the last two years of the experiment in 2016 and 2017, so that we could collect measurements that much faster. But one of the things we saw post carp was that the effectiveness of the nets for catching fish declined as a result of the growth of algae on those fish nets. The, something that I hadn't anticipated, that the reality is I think the marsh, the Delta Marsh was in fact limited by light. The growth of plants was limited by light. The water was so murky that light simply wasn't sufficient. Once we cleared up the water by removing carp, the light increased and the algae went nuts. Uh, so it was on our nets. There was also massive amounts of what we call metaphyton, which is a filamentous algae that floats on the surface in sheltered places, at least not all, not widespread around the marsh, but certainly in sheltered places, we saw lots of, of metaphyton. And we did see carp, you know, I, to those who think we were somehow uh, depleting uh, the uh, uh, habitat for carp, the reality is there were sufficient numbers of small juvenile carp in the marsh to sustain any population. We, were, we certainly weren't going to deplete the population through the exclusion of the adults. Uh, and the most encouraging sign of improvement that I think I saw was the fact that we saw dramatic improvement in the abundance of submerged plants. To be honest, I didn't expect the increase to be as dramatic as it was or as rapid. But within the last two years, in fact, another reason to switch to using an airboat to go get around the marsh wasn't just so we could collect our measurements that much faster, but also because it was becoming physically impossible to travel the marsh with outboard motors that were in the water. In other words, the propellers of the motors would get clogged almost immediately with submerged vegetation. This isn't a problem we ever had before. It was a good problem, of course, because the vegetation was back. Uh, but it was nevertheless, it did constrain our abilities to get around the marsh. So I'm confident in saying now that the exclusion of carp did have the intended consequence, which is to dramatically improve the abundance of vegetation. Now, of course, there's a lot more to it because the vegetation is only one element of the ecosystem. Ultimately, we hope that it creates the conditions that are favorable for the small invertebrates, for example, that inhabit this vegetation the amphibians like the frogs and so on, and ultimately that it would benefit the birds. Well, uh, every year the Manitoba government conducts a survey of waterfowl in Delta Marsh going back to the 1960s. And these surveys are shown, one of the sets of the data from that survey, for example, is shown here. This is the abundance of canvasback ducks, the number per kilo, uh, square kilometer in the marsh. And as you can see in the 1960s, 70s, and possibly even into the early 80s, there were fairly significant numbers of canvasbacks. This, however, changed. And through the uh, 80s, 90s, 2000s, their numbers were dramatically low. In fact, I, I was told on any number of occasions that even if the ducks came back to Delta Marsh, we shouldn't expect to see much improvement in any broods because it was widely known, and this was said to me by a number of waterfowl specialists, it was widely known that Delta Marsh was a staging marsh 
It was not a brood marsh. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that they proved wrong, that in fact, Delta Marsh has become a brood marsh. Uh, and we did see fairly regularly on some of our tours, uh, considerable numbers of ducklings and other bird young. So since the structures were in place, the numbers of canvasbacks have gone up. It is sporadic, I admit. Uh, it's not always seen every single year. The success of our carp exclusion is not always effective entirely. It depends to, to some extent by in the, the timing with which the screens are installed. Sometimes there are conditions beyond our control. If, for example, there is a flood year, as there may be this year, our ability to put the screens in may be limited by the necessity to protect all sorts of structures through the use of the portage diversion. So we don't know, we aren't saying necessarily that everything is now back in place, that we have seen the full restoration of Delta Marsh, but things have improved. There are a number of reasons to say that there is a basis for cautious hope that the submerged vegetation of Delta Marsh is being restored. And this in turn has benefits from waterfowl and other birds. Before I conclude this presentation though, I, I wanna mention two things. One is that there are other factors at work. In other words, it is not simply common carp that are causing the changes we see in Delta Marsh and in other coastal wetlands. Of course, hybrid cattails and other invasive species have a, fat, a role to play the altered hydrology of Lake Manitoba, the fact that the periodic ups and downs of the lake levels have been moderated through the regulation of Lake Manitoba and of course on Lake Winnipeg. The other factor of course is chemical. The chemical contaminants from the landscape continue. In fact, arguably even more so because of the installation of tile drainage across much of the Portage Plains that would potentially drain more of the agricultural land with its associated chemicals into Delta Marsh. This work that I have described was not the sole work of me or even just the immediate people working with me. It was the result of numerous people, including Amanda. Uh, Amanda, our illustrious host tonight, was one of the many people who, through diligent hard work, helped us to acquire the information. In this picture, we see many of the graduate students that were involved at one point in the experiment, and they have gone on to many in, uh, other endeavors. Uh, Pascal Badju, for example, is standing on the left-hand side, and he is doing really important work on the storage of carbon in wetlands and the degree to which wetland restoration have benefits. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge the funds that enabled all of this work to be done the funds that were raised by Ducks Unlimited Canada for its Restoring the Tradition project, from the province of Manitoba, from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, uh, Manitoba Hydro, and a variety of other agencies, all of which helped us to do this experiment. It was not done alone, and uh, it was, I hope, uh, worth the effort. So with that, I will thank you for your attention this evening, and if there are questions, as I say, I will try my best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gord. I saw that we did indeed have some questions while you were talking. Mm -hmm. um, the first from, from Joe, she asked, how do carp increase nitrogen? And I think that would be uh, phosphorus. Also phosphate, yes, yeah. nitrogen and phosphorus. Yes, the way it happens is that natural wetland sediments are very highly organic. It's the remains of plants and animals that have lived and died in the wetland. Well, that organic matter decomposes, and one of the products of decomposition are the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. So if you're looking in the water of a wetland, you'll often find the levels of nutrients relatively low because the concentrations that occur in the sediments are sometimes factors of 10, 100 sometimes higher in the sediments. Those sediments are very rich in nutrients, and that's why the burrowing action of carp uh, to look for food in the sediments is so destructive, not only because it suspends the nutrient, uh, the, uh, the suspended solids, the, the sediment particles themselves, but also because it then releases this nitrogen and phosphorus stored in the sediments, and then that is made advantage of by the, uh, by the algae and the other plants in the system. Okay, thank you. The next one from Dwayne. Are you going to be breeding smaller carp as a result of this? I assume that's the carp exclusion. I suppose that's a possibility. Um, I don't think carp are able to breed until they're about three years old, by which time they're a fairly good size. I don't think 
that smaller carp are likely to be selected for. In other words, we're not causing evolution to give rise to smaller carp because the reality is, uh, although I say I'm pleased that we've been able to do something for Delta Marsh, we have done nothing for all of the other potential spawning habitat for carp around Lake Manitoba and elsewhere. So there are lots of other places for carp to spawn and therefore I don't see it as a potential selective pressure. If Delta Marsh was the only place, well, possibly, but I don't think it's likely. Okay, next from Ken, we have um, the provincial government plans on dredging the channel at Grand Beach so boats can enter Lake Winnipeg and vice versa. This will allow the carp back into the lagoon. In your opinion, is this a good or bad idea? Well, I, I suspect that even when the lagoon wasn't as deep as it is going to be, um, the carp are still able to get in. Carp are remarkable at being able to swim through literally a few centimeters of water. So even if that connection between the lagoon and Lake Winnipeg was just centimeters deep, the carp would get in, I, I have a feeling. Um, I'm not a big fan though of dredging simply because it reduces the, the abundance of habitat for other things that are living in that, in that area. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that it's gonna get rid of all the vegetation that was there. It's gonna get rid of any of the associated invertebrates and other things. I, I don't think it's a good idea to dredge if it isn't necessary. I realize the benefit is for boating, and uh, so that's why they're doing it, I think. Um, but personally, if I had my druthers, I would say it's not a good idea to dredge any uh, coastal wetland. Okay, next question is, what is the life expectancy of carp? That's a good one. I actually don't know. Um, I personally am not a carp expert, uh, but um, I, we, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's at least a dozen years. But I'm not sure if anybody really truly knows. I, I guess you'd have to keep them in captivity to truly know what the life expectancy is. Sorry, I can't say. Okay, I think you answered the next one as to what age do carp begin laying eggs. And you had mentioned yep. three years, yep. I believe. Um, the next question from Susan, how have zebra mussels affected the marsh? Well, so far they have not. Um, but it's very likely that zebra mussels will begin growing on our street, our structures on those, uh, those uh, bars. And that's a potential problem. What it's gonna entail therefore is gonna to have to be cleaning activities done. Now the bars aren't in there permanently. So it would be probably fairly straightforward to remove them and brush the, uh, the zebra mussels off. They actually, the design of the structures is such that we can remove one screen while leaving another in place. So in other words, we don't let carp in while the, the screens would be out to remove mussels. Um, but, um, but the marsh in terms of its overall uh, habitat isn't great in a place for zebra mussels. They, they typically like firm surfaces in which to attach. The only place I could envision zebra mussels really thriving would be on the surfaces of submerged plants like, like cattails and bulrushes. Uh, so possibly, but they're, as far as I know, they're not abundant yet. They are known to be in Lake Manitoba now, but as to my knowledge, they have not yet been observed in Delta Marsh. Okay, thank you. Um, next question we have is, do carp overwinter in the marsh? Uh, not in any abundance. Uh, it is possible. Carp are particularly good at surviving low oxygen conditions. And it's conceivable that in deep areas of the marsh where the water is deep enough that there might be sufficient volume of liquid water under the winter ice, that they might be able to survive there, even if the oxygen levels drop quite low. But the reality is the vast majority of Delta Marsh is simply too deep, uh, or pardon me, the opposite, too shallow uh, for, for carp. That uh, the, generally, the, the depth of ice in the winter is usually at least a meter, usually three feet or more. And much of Delta Marsh is about that depth. The, re the reality therefore is that there's either no water underneath the ice, or if there is, it goes completely anoxic. In other words, there's no oxygen at all it's unlikely that carp could survive there. So the majority of the carp do not overwinter in the marsh. They move out into Lake Manitoba. They spend the winter there. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have, can we encourage the shrubbery and trees along the edge of the lake to assist the kidneys of the lake? Absolutely, uh, shrubbery, trees are good. Uh, I would submit that even uh, the emergent vegetation like cattails and bulrushes and frags and other things is also good. So. I personally like nature's defenses to armor shorelines. 
I know there are sometimes tendencies for people to put in things like gabions to help in reducing erosion, but the reality is uh, nature has got a, a, an advantage over anything that a human can create, and that's that it's self-sustaining. You know, if a human puts in gabions, you have to maintain them, and they will be have to be maintained. There's nothing like nature to keep it uh, maintain self-maintained. So yes, absolutely, uh, vegetation of any kind around shorelines is a good idea. Okay, and uh, next from Karen, we have: Is there any economic use for carp, such as omega three oils or animal food? You know, I really had ho high hopes for this one. Uh, for a number of years, we had a guy coming to Manitoba uh, with plan to establish a, um, a uh, industrial protein uh, facility. The idea being is that uh, you can use carp and in fact, a lot of other biomass as a source of industrial protein that could be used in a variety of ways, including you know, making things like shampoo. Um, I thought it was a great idea. I thought it was a way to make uh, carp of an economic value. Um, now, since that time, and by the way, it never developed. I don't, for reasons that I've never fully understood, uh, there are there is value in in economic value in carp, which is that the row of carp, the the eggs, in other words, uh, is a an acceptable alternative for the eggs of sturgeon to make caviar. And uh, having eaten carp itself, I can attest that it's not great eating. Uh, you, carp are not good to eat, but carp caviar, on the other hand, is actually pretty darn tasty. And of course, every carp egg that you eat is not only a bit of nourishment and, and enjoyment, it's also one less carp that's going to find its way into places like Delta Marsh. So yes, I, I think there is potential economic development. Uh, there's other things as well. I've heard, for example, that you can make a pretty darn good grade of leather out of the skin of a carp that, uh, that unlike cattle leather, does not turn hard when it gets wet. So in other words, if you made a pair of gloves out of carp leather, if you wet, got them wet, they wouldn't they wouldn't turn hard the way uh, you know cowhide would. Very interesting. I think the second year I worked at Delta Marsh, there were people with a big barge, perhaps um, collecting collecting carp. Mm. Um, so Andrew says, I guess he looked up um, the life expectancy. Says twenty years for Eurasian carp is what he had found. Okay, and uh, good to know. Yeah, just some people saying thank you that your work was uh, instrumental in in leading them on their path as scientists and uh, yeah lots of people found this very interesting and thank you very much for uh, coming to talk with us Gord. it looks like we've answered all of the questions very, very thank thoroughly. You. Thank you. So yeah, so we'll just uh, end up here. So like I said, a big thank you to Dr. Goldsboro for a really interesting presentation. Um, Delta Marsh is a favorite birding and recreation spot for people, and we really hope it stays that way for many years to come uh, with the help of this work. Although, like you said, there's many factors that lead into the health of the marsh. Um, and yeah, so thank you also to everyone who joined us today. We have one more webinar next week on the redheaded woodpecker before we break for a week after that. Um, so next Wednesday at seven o'clock, we have another presentation in our webinar series, and there is still space available if you are interested in joining us for that.